This is one of the largest creatures on Earth. But it's not a whale. It's a really big shark. They're called whale sharks, and they can weigh more than 30 tons and be longer than a city bus. They may be sharks, but we don't have to worry. They eat only the smallest animals in the sea. And like other sharks, they are threatened. Their numbers have declined dramatically, decimated by the global trade in shark fins and demand for their meat. Marine conservationists Brad Norman and Denny Ramirez study the behavior and biology of these enigmatic giants. At Mexico's Holbosch Island and Australia's Ningaloo Reef, whale sharks congregate each year in search of food, and researchers also gather here to learn more about the sharks and how to save them from extinction. A booming ecotourism industry revolves around snorkeling with whale sharks. But the explosive growth of the industry may be scaring the animals away. And hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, the world's largest aquarium is home to four growing whale sharks. for at least 60 million years. But we know very little about whale sharks. We see them so rarely. They weren't even identified as a species until the mid-19th century. One of the few things we do know is that their numbers are decreasing. Whale sharks are cold-blooded, warm-water fish. They live in temperate and tropical seas near the equator. These giant sharks are amazing travelers, and they migrate immense distances in search of food. And this is what gets them into trouble. While they may be protected in one country's waters, they've been hunted relentlessly in others. And a single whale shark fin can be worth thousands of dollars. and rich undersea realm. Countless species of marine life thrive here. At certain times of the year, the reef explodes with life. It's called a food pulse, when corals, fish, and other creatures lay their eggs. This mass simultaneous spawning injects so much food into the water column that predators just can't eat them all. Most of the eggs drift away on the currents unharmed. It's a brilliant survival strategy. But the tiny creatures aren't out of harm's way just yet. They are no match for one of the ocean's biggest binge eaters, whale sharks.
Along the western coast of Australia, Cape Range National Park and the Ningaloo Reef stretch for almost 200 miles. Perth is a remote city on the edge of a remote continent, but that's not where the whale sharks are. To find them, you must fly another thousand miles north to the tip of the most westerly part of Australia. This is about as far as you can get from anywhere in Australia. Until 1967, there wasn't much to speak of at Cape Range, except perhaps for a few fishermen. The Cold War was in full swing and the US Navy built a submarine communications base on Australian soil. The radio towers are the tallest man-made structures in the Southern Hemisphere. The base eventually closed down in the early 90s, and the neighboring town of Exmouth lost their main employer. The economic forecast was grim. The whale sharks, of course, had never left. It took a transplanted village doctor from England who loved scuba diving to help sow the seeds of a new industry. I'm a general practitioner. I had uh, become very keen on underwater photography and bought myself a small cine camera before I went to Exmouth. And I, I was just uh, falling in love with the whole marine environment up there, the coral reefs, the, the manta rays, dugong sharks, all the, the, the creatures that are up there at Ningaloo. Then in one day in March, 1983, suddenly after several hours of searching, we encountered a, a really big shark. I finally got in the water and swam with it and, and filmed it, and I was ecstatic. I was over the moon. I mean, to swim next to such a huge creature, to be able to approach it and get so close, it was just a, a mind-blowing experience. I knew that whale sharks had been seen at Ningaloo before occasionally, but really nothing had prepared me for the numbers that we would see coming in each autumn. And uh, after that first encounter in 1983, we went on in the next uh, two or three weeks to see um, numerous whale sharks, about 20 that season. Taylor had stumbled onto a remarkable annual event. Each year, from March through June, giant whale sharks appeared seemingly out of the blue. Jeff theorized that for a few short months in the Austral fall, whale sharks gathered attracted by seasonal spawning events at Ningaloo Reef. He didn't realize the potential of his discovery at the time and even thought about keeping it a secret, but his pioneering research and film footage eventually brought the story to the world. Television networks, marine biologists, and eventually tourists began flocking to Cape Range to witness the annual whale shark migration. Taylor is now considered to be the father of whale shark tourism in Western Australia. In the late 80s, a handful of businesses sprang up in the tiny villages of Coral Bay and Exmouth that relied on whale sharks' yearly visits. Animal-based ecotourism is now the number one industry. I have to tell you about a day um, this season, they um, spotted a very large whale shark. Um, our crew estimated it to be probably about 14 metres in length, which is just about the length of the boat we go out on. From April to July, whale sharks are an enormous part of our business. They're very important to us as a community and as a dive centre. We have clients from all over the world, and that's especially interesting when you consider how far away we are from everything. Our season so far has been fantastic. We had excellent sharks starting about the beginning of April, and we expect them to run till about the third week of July this year. My first whale shark was in about 1996, and I see this enormous fish swimming out of the blue and suddenly materializing in front of my eyes. It was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. Coral Bay and neighboring Exmouth, whale sharks are big business. Much of the local economy revolves around swimming with the giant fish. To 
Today, marine conservationist Brad Norman is joining a diverse group of tourists from around the globe. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Exmouth Dive Centre and your whale shark adventure of the day. We have had a lot of action out there yesterday with my sister and with five or six whale sharks. Okay, yay! yay! What's going to happen this morning is we're going to hop onto the bus. It's going to take us about 40 minutes. Are we ready? Whale sharks are the number one attraction at Ningaloo Marine Park at this time of the year, between about April and June. There's more than 7,000 tourists per year swim with whale sharks, so it's a really, really big industry to the region, and it's great to get that many people interested in whale sharks and taking the message about their conservation back to their friends and family. The whale sharks are found in deeper water, outside the shallow reef. Smaller skiffs ferry the tourists out to the dive boats waiting just offshore. For Brad Norman, the people on this whale shark watching trip are more than just tourists. They're research assistants, helping to unlock the mysteries of this fascinating animal. Swimming with whale sharks, that's what people come here to do. But there are strict guidelines. The maximum number of divers in the water at one time and the minimum safe distance from the animals. Once you've seen the shark, you move to the side, okay? You'll be in front of it, it'll come towards you. Move to one side, and then turn around and just start swimming alongside the whale shark. Hey guys, I got a whale shark down here. Okay, hands up in group one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two more, who else is in group one? In group one? Okay, quickly. Okay, go, go, go! The guide's upraised arm indicates the shark's position. This is the perfect opportunity for the group to swim alongside a whale shark. But you have to move fast. So little was known about whale sharks around the world and I got to reading about them. I've been to Ningaloo and I was helping with some other research on fish. Heard about the whale sharks and got very interested in trying to learn more about them. Then the opportunity came up where I could swim with a whale shark for the first time and it really was one of the most amazing experiences I can remember. Jumping in the water into the deep blue, we're in about 90 or 100 metres and looking under the water trying to see something coming at me and then all of a sudden out of the blue come this massive, massive creature. I mean, the size of a bus. It was, it literally was a bus underwater coming towards me and I was just shell-shocked. I was just looking at it go past and uh, it was so graceful and so beautiful. It really made me really want to help this species as much as I could. That was massive. Yeah. <laughs> That's hard work keeping up with it. It's unbelievable. It's one of the best experiences of my life, really. It's <laughs> no, it's really amazing. It's a big ocean out there, and boats don't stumble onto whale sharks simply by chance. They need a little help from above. Basically how the aerial spotting works is the planes go up and spot for the boats, cruise along the reef, search various grid patterns and then when we find a shark we'll call the boats, give them a position on the reef and then basically talk them into the shark using the clock code, so 12 o'clock at uh, say 4 or 5 boat lengths for the boats and talk them in through, through about 400 metres into the shark and then onto the shark and they take over once they get a visual. A 
small fleet of planes takes to the skies each morning during whale shark season. It would be difficult for dive boats to find the animals without aerial spotting. Even though the sharks are frequently at the surface, they don't breach or surface for air like whales do. Caesar, Caesar, this is Norwest there. Yeah, go ahead, Norwest there, Caesar, here. Yeah, g'day, Craig. I've uh, just picked up about an eight metre shark here uh, off your one o'clock, about 15 boat lengths. Yeah, right, mate, you just uh, caught me onto it. I'll be there in a second. Yeah, right, mate. Uh, you let me know when I'm within four boat lengths. All right, you will do. OK, Caesar, and that's uh, coming up in your 11 o'clock. You're about four and a half boat lengths away. Yeah, beautiful, mate. Uh, yep, I've got a visual. That's great. OK, guys, go, go, go! threats facing whale sharks. I knew they were a species in trouble. Being a uh, marine biologist and somebody very interested in the oceans, it seemed to, to be a perfect match to, to save, trying to help save the, the largest fish in the sea. Whale sharks are such a difficult species to study, really, because they do roam the oceans. 70% of the planet's water and we just can't really keep an eye on everything. There's niches that are important to them. We don't know where those important spots are to protect them. Another day, another whale shark. But which one? Has it been the Ningaloo before? Has it been seen and identified before? Brad Norman and other researchers had noticed that every whale shark had a different configuration of white spots, scars, and marks. We knew that whale sharks have spots and lines all over their body, possibly could be used to identify individuals. It was a case of actually refining that thought. When you're working with thousands and thousands of photographs, it becomes unworkable to try to match things up by eye. Brad photographs the pattern of spots, adding to a growing database of images that identify individual animals. Science and conservation depends on data, and for whale sharks, photography is a primary tool. Like a human fingerprint, each animal has its own distinct pattern of spots. The patterns are complex, but there's something similar in the night sky, the galaxies of outer space there was an existing technology that could catalog distant stars and planets. NASA's Hubble telescope utilized an advanced computer program to identify astral bodies. With the help of a computer programmer and an astrophysicist, the NASA technology was modified and adapted. Instead of identifying stars and galaxies, the new program identifies individual whale sharks. The process starts with a photo of an area near the fifth gill slit, and the spots are connected with triangles. The computer program then analyzes the image and compares the information with other whale sharks in the database. People can just go to whalesharks.org and click on the website. There's a uh, report and encounter page, date, time, location, and uh, they can submit a photograph online. There's a little bit of work that we have to do with the processing of the photographs. We run a scan, come up with either a match for a shark previously seen or a new shark. Tourists and divers can become involved in two ways. One, learning more about whale sharks by going to the website. The second way is to swim with a whale shark, take a photo and send that photo with the date and location of sighting. And that'll help us understand more about um, the numbers and the movements of these whale sharks around the world. At Perth's Murdoch University, Brad Norman continues his pioneering work in whale shark identification. 
His efforts have garnered him the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise, and he is now an emerging explorer with the National Geographic Society. At Ningaloo Reef, tourists come for the experience of swimming with whale sharks. And at the same time, they help to increase our knowledge of these enigmatic animals. There's many mysteries to whale sharks. We don't know where they're breeding. We don't know how often they breed. We don't know really where exactly they're migrating to and from and how many actually are out there. These are points that as to date we haven't been able to answer. But as we build the program, we raise the awareness, we get thousands of people involved in helping with the research um, for whale sharks, I think we can answer the questions. You don't have to travel to remote Western Australia to see whale sharks. Hundreds of kilometers from the nearest saltwater, the world's largest aquarium is home to four growing whale sharks. This idyllic undersea realm appears to be a thriving coral reef. Rare sharks and rays patrol the sandy bottom. But this isn't the tropical Pacific, or even the Caribbean. It's the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, and it's over 200 miles from the nearest ocean. Dozens of exhibits house an impressive collection. 100,000 animals represent over 500 different species. Nearly the size of a football field and 30 feet deep, this is the biggest individual fish tank on the planet, the Ocean Voyager exhibit. It holds enough water to fill 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And they build it big for a reason. The star attractions here are whale sharks. They join a cast of thousands in the aquarium's most popular exhibit. The whale shark was a real challenge for the team here at the Georgia Aquarium in designing this exhibit. It, it is a huge animal and we had to create an exhibit here, a habitat, where these animals could remain their entire lives and be able to comfortably swim all that time as well. It's 285 feet from one end to the other. And that would give even an adult a whale shark plenty of room to swim without having to turn around in, in a circle. Behind the scenes and out of sight, there's an entire city of pumps, pipes, and filters. Where you're standing right now, you're in the heart of the Ocean Voyager exhibit. Everything in this room is dedicated to ensuring that Ocean Voyager has good, clean, healthy water for the animals. Being in Atlanta, being about five hours from the nearest ocean, we actually have to create our own salt water here on site. We've designed the turnover rate to be about once every 60 minutes. And that means that each drop of water comes out of the exhibit and goes through the entire filtration process every hour. It's all run by computers. 3,200 control points are connected with over 25 miles of wiring. And keeping it up and running smoothly is a massive undertaking. It takes a lot of behind the scenes work to keep this equipment up and running properly. Water in dozens of exhibits, all eight million gallons of it, needs to be kept sparkling clean. And so do the windows. Every day, a team of volunteer divers descend into Ocean Voyager. Window washers with scuba tanks. The cleaning guys go in every morning and they take uh, baby diapers and they wipe down all of the acrylic in the exhibit making sure all of the uh, sand and gravel and everything is off of it so it doesn't get scratched and also wiping down algae so it doesn't build up. Today, there's a new group of divers. For the first time, the whale sharks are going to be filmed by an underwater television crew. Veteran cinematographers Tom Campbell and Neil McDaniel had worked in virtually every marine environment on Earth. But this is unlike any dive they've ever done. Saltwater and expensive electronics don't mix. 
Technician Dennis Kaufman prepares the high-tech housing and camera equipment for the dive. Big cameras for big fish. Keeping out of the way of an animal the size of a bus is definitely a concern. But safety divers are more wary of a great hammerhead shark and a couple of very territorial goliath groupers. Everything in the Ocean Voyager tank is huge. Guys, today our objective is to clean the windows and there's going to be some filming going on at the same time. Our time and depth is however long it takes to do the windows, which should be about an hour. Depth is no greater than 30 feet. Meridius and Jim will be your safeties, so they will be hanging out with you guys and these guys will be covering them. It's definitely the coolest indoor dive you'll probably find in the world. <laughs> and it, it rivals even uh, dives out there in open ocean. And you know, at the end of the day, there's, I, in all my years of diving, I've never seen whale sharks in the, in the wild. And to be able to dive with them here uh, daily is, is amazing. Well, this is the first for us in a big tank like this, huh? I, I've been in, in aquarium tanks, Tom, but uh, they've all been about, I don't know, one tenth the size of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. Above water, the high definition camera system weighs nearly 100 pounds and is very awkward to carry. But underwater, it's a lightest effect. The first resident to check out the camera team is the giant hammerhead. Fortunately, he's very well fed. You gotta remember when you do an exhibit like this, there is no handbook called uh, Whale Sharks for Dummies. We don't have a guide on how to keep the whale sharks. Now we know a lot about sharks in aquariums, and we can apply that knowledge to this, the largest of all the uh, sharks, uh, when we design the exhibit. But every day is still a, you know, a learning curve for us. We're learning a lot how fast they grow. Uh, we have males and female whale sharks here, so we're very interested in how their biology and their behavior changes as they mature. We have some great opportunities to learn even more about them because this is like a, a laboratory, a big laboratory, where we can study the whale shark, learn a little bit about its sensory biology. You know, what does it actually see? Uh, what can it smell? Uh, how does it find its food? These are all questions that we can learn here in this aquarium environment, which would be very hard to, uh, to learn in the ocean. kind of neat about it is that we've seen a lot of these fish in the open ocean but everybody looks so happy down there I mean all the fish look happy they're just <laughs> moving around doing what they do and uh, it's really something have that wide variety and the whale sharks are fabulous really cool I mean it's just amazing to be in the water with four whale sharks that big grouper in the corner though boy he gave me a scare I was filming the tunnel there and all of a sudden he showed up and that thing is big, really big. And he kind of looked at me with those big eyeballs, and I'm thinking, oh, I think I'm in his territory. I'm going to go out of here. These are the only whale sharks in an aquarium in the Western Hemisphere. There's a handful of others in smaller facilities in Asia, closer to where the animals were originally captured. The sharks in Georgia, however, had a lot farther to travel. The Atlanta whale sharks were originally caught by fishermen in Taiwan and were destined for the dinner plate. But the Georgia Aquarium had other plans. We had a good baseline knowledge of how to move animals. We just had to supersize it all. But basically what we did is we found the largest aircraft pallet we could get. We built the biggest box we could build for that uh, aircraft pallet. 
measured the inside, said, okay, we need a shark this size or smaller. And that's how we, uh, we, we geared everything toward the size of the equipment that you see. So there were a lot of uh, intense moments getting the animals out of the sea pen. We had cultural barriers, language barriers, Chinese, Japanese, English, Taiwanese. We had challenges with equipment the first time out. Uh, of course, uh, then there's permitting along the way as far as aircraft takeoff and landing. So there were a number of intense moments along the way. Yep. Okay, bring it down, bring it down. One of our biggest concerns in moving the animals was the weight of their body on their cartilaginous skeleton. So the only time that we lifted them out of the water was in Taiwan when we moved them into the transport box. Down, down, down. Boats, cranes, huge planes and life support systems. Getting these immense animals from Taiwan to Atlanta safely took tremendous ingenuity, a bit of luck, and a lot of very hard work. It was a logistical nightmare, but in the end, it all came together. Remarkably, after nearly two days of confinement in small shipping tanks and being transported around the globe, all the whale sharks immediately responded well to their new home. Feeding whale sharks and other residents of the aquarium and keeping them healthy is no ordinary job. Good nutrition is a constant challenge. The food needs to be of the highest quality, restaurant grade, in fact. And whale sharks eat a lot of food. The whale sharks eat about five kilos of food a day, and that contains krill, squid, silver size, and a gel formula. Fine dining, whale shark style, a la carte. The whale sharks can't be fed together. It would be too chaotic. Each animal instead has its own station. The males are fed from small inflatable dinghies and the females from bridge platforms. Twice a day, these whale sharks are fed and we're feeding them a diet fairly similar to what they might get in nature. We know from our research down in Mexico, they're feeding on small shrimps very small, a couple of millimeters in length. They also feed on copepods and fish eggs. But here at the aquarium, we're also feeding them small fish, small shrimps. When we make a diet that we prepare, we actually add gelatin to it. We grind it all up and make it into a gelatin. We can cut it up in small cubes and add some extra nutrients to that. So twice a day, those animals are fed here at the aquarium. And that was one challenge we weren't quite sure of when we uh, were designing this exhibit. Would they actually feed properly and normally? Each shark has been conditioned to feed from a different colored bucket at opposite sides of the exhibit. They've been very well trained, but the males and females still need to be separated at feeding time. We keep the males and the female whale sharks separated during feeding just to really give them more room. They're very large animals, and they do take a bit of space to just turn around um, in order for them to feed. And we don't want them all jumbled up together and, and banging up each other. We're one of the first people in North America to ever have whale sharks, and so some of the research that we're doing and what we're learning from is, is very new, and we're able to share this data with other facilities in Asia. For example, our team has learned how to routinely give the whale sharks an examination, be able to obtain blood work, and share these techniques that someday may be very applicable to making a difference for wildlife in wild places. No one likes a needle, whale sharks included. Having the immense animals in an aquarium setting has provided staff with a remarkable opportunity to learn more about the animals. It's
In their state-of-the-art lab, ongoing research with blood and tissue samples helped the aquarium piece together clues to whale shark biology and genetics. Much of the research at the Georgia Aquarium is complemented by work done on the open sea. Scientists and tourists travel to tiny Holbosch Island to swim with whale sharks. But all is not well in paradise. Holbosch is a tiny island northwest of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Isolated, Holbosch Island was once reputed to be a haven for pirates. It became a base for fishermen, and now it's a popular tourist destination. The number one attraction for visitors, whale sharks. Every summer, nutrient-rich water from the Caribbean Sea flows south across the shallow continental shelf. The currents fuel a massive plankton bloom. Like coral spawning events off Ningaloo Reef in Australia, this feast of zooplankton and fish eggs is a magnet for whale sharks. The sharks attract scientists like Denny Ramirez, a marine biologist from the Biological Research Institute in La Paz, Mexico. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? The whale sharks also draw tourists, lots of them. So you can't see. Ecotourism has dramatically changed the economy of this tiny island. Fishermen have become tour operators. This was a village of fishermen, and they would see the whale shark every year. But they never thought it would be something important for them. The best strategy to find whale sharks, get out on the water early. It can take hours to locate the animals and there's no aerial spotter planes at Holbosch. Rafael de la Parra is the coordinator of the Domino Project, a unique program that partners scientists and tour operators to study the sharks and to regulate tourist activities. Sometimes the best way to find whale sharks is to follow the local tour boats. They are pretty well organized right now. They will take turns and they will try to not bother the animal. They will wait a little and three people in the water at the same time, then they will drift away. Then another boat comes and, and drop his people again and so on. Research and tourism go hand in hand at Holbosch. Operators let the scientists know where the sharks are and relay basic information, such as the sex and size of the sharks and if they've been tagged. But today, there's only one shark, and that creates a problem. Tour operators take priority, and the researchers must wait for their chance to work on the animal. The standard rule is that tourists go first and scientists go last. Finally, the tour boats are finished for the day. Before the shark has a chance to get away, the researchers spring into action. The first order of business is to implant a yellow ID tag. This is a new shark, one that hasn't been seen or identified before. Denny Ramirez wants to find out how whale sharks from around the world are related genetically, where they're going and where they're from. To do this, she first needs photos to identify them. Denny and other scientists at Holbosch send their photo ID images to Brad Norman's database in Australia. Together, researchers around the world are starting to gather a broader understanding of population numbers and global distribution. What's the number? The number of the picture is 44 to 60. Wow. 
To learn more about whale shark genetics, she needs to get a DNA sample. She's an expert freediver, but it's still a challenge to keep up with the big animals. Skillfully, she extracts a tiny piece of flesh with a sharp tool. These small samples are key pieces in a genetic puzzle. Back on the surface, Denny carefully unscrews the sharp spear tip, which holds a sample of fatty tissue. The flesh goes into a sterile container filled with alcohol to keep the DNA from breaking down. Good sample? Sí. Una muy buena muestra. This sample will join hundreds of others back at her lab in La Paz. The final task is implanting an acoustic locator tag, which will allow the researchers to track the shark in local waters. But the tag's tether has to go deeper into muscle tissue to ensure it stays in place. It causes the animal some discomfort, and it leaves the scene quickly. Next morning, Denny Ramirez joins a group of scientists from Moat Marine Laboratory and the Georgia Aquarium. These researchers are at Holbosch to gather information about everything from what the animals are eating to local water conditions. It all helps with efforts in Georgia to keep their captive animals healthy and happy in their adopted home. The work that we're doing here in Holbosch complements the work that we do at the aquarium in a lot of ways. Um, so we, we learn a lot in the aquarium setting, um, and then we also learn a lot in the field. Um, but standing alone, neither one of those is really the complete picture. We're actually looking at what they're eating and why they're there. And so we do that basically by taking plankton toes at every place where we see animals that are actually foraging. Yesterday and the day before, it was fish eggs. Uh, normally, it's, it's different types of zooplankton, um, suggested shrimp, copepods, amphipods, things like that. While Denny prepares her equipment, there's time to test water conditions. Please don't put her in gear. It's a lot colder down at the, toward the bottom. Almost 30 degrees at the surface and 24 degrees down, 50 feet down. Once various studies are completed, the scientists begin searching for sharks. But just like the previous day, the research team has difficulty finding any animals. They have to rely once more on the tour boats. Lured by booming ecotourism, unlicensed and unregulated boats from as far away as Cancun are now crowding an already saturated market. Whale shark ecotourism has really taken off in the last five years. If ecotourism on whale sharks becomes too predominant so that in all areas of the world, boats on virtually every animal, I think that the effect is going to be negative in the long run, and I think that ecotourism is going to end up being overall a negative impact on the whale shark population as a whole. I fear that we're going to drive the sharks away from these important areas where they come to feed. As the tour boats wind down for the day, it's time for the scientists to get to work. This is a uh, pop-off satellite archival tag. This tag accumulates information on shark's depth and temperature of the water and the locations of the shark as it, as it migrates. And we insert this dart head underneath the shark's skin and it rides with the shark then. And then at a preset time, the connection to the, between the tag and the tether releases. In this case, in 90 days, it will come to the surface where it floats and then send all of its data back to us in the laboratory via satellite. It appears to be another unidentified shark. First, Rafael de la Parra implants an ID tag. The shark now has a number. In just a few short seasons, 
team has tagged and identified over 600 animals. Denny quickly gets her DNA sample, and Bob Huter successfully implants the satellite tag. Whether it's Australia or Mexico, whale shark tourism has proven that a live shark is worth more than a dead one. But is this type of tourism harmful to the animals? The fact that we still don't have a great understanding of the dynamics of their behavior, again, underscores the importance of us being very careful with this resource and not kill the goose that laid the golden egg. The goose being whale sharks, the golden egg being the economy that it's been driving in terms of ecotourism. We've got to take a very conservative approach uh, in terms of how we allow ecotourism to utilize this resource, just like we would do with fisheries. Although Holbosch Island and other destinations are experiencing some growing pains with ecotourism, there are far greater threats to whale sharks. Since the 19th century, whale sharks have been a target of fishermen in countries like India, China, and the Philippines. In recent decades, the growing popularity of shark fin soup has fueled a terribly destructive fishery. Global demand for the tasteless, dried cartilage of shark fins has helped to wipe out up to 90% of all sharks. And whale sharks have become a prime target. A single fin can be worth a fortune to an impoverished fisherman. But the whale shark's real enemies are the corporations who buy, process, and market the fins. It's a multi-million dollar industry that knows no borders. In 1997, filmmaker and photojournalist Erin Calmez traveled to the Philippines on assignment. She discovered that whale sharks were being killed for their fins, and the fins were processed for export to Asia. She documented the destructive practices and brought the story to the world's attention in her groundbreaking film, The Whale Shark Hunters. Her work exposed an international trade in shark fins and meat that exploited not only the sharks, but the native fishermen themselves. The dramatic film helped turn the tide on the exploitation of the animals. It is now illegal to kill whale sharks in the Philippines, and other countries like Honduras and Belize soon followed their lead. Instead of killing sharks, fishermen began focusing their efforts on tagging, research, and ecotourism. Mexico outlawed shark finning in 2007, and Taiwan declared that 2008 would be the last year of their commercial whale shark fishery. The future is looking much brighter for whale sharks. One of my greatest fears, you know, years ago was that we might have been too late to save the whale sharks because their numbers had been declining so dramatically. I was a little pessimistic at the time, but the outstanding response that we've had from many different stakeholders all around the world is giving me confidence that we can be optimistic about the future of this threatened fish, but we need to be on our toes and we need to continue the hard work we've undertaken. Every day when we come to the aquarium and we watch people come to this exhibit, we know that most of the people who come here are never going to see the ocean or, or even see a whale shark in the ocean. The expressions that people show, sometimes tears, when they see the big window here and these amazing fish come swimming by them, we know we've made a connection. And what gives me optimism is that next generation of kids in particular are going to include the future marine biologists who are going to take care of these animals, protect them where necessary to ensure that we have whale sharks and other big fishes in the sea forever. We're learning more and more about these amazing animals every day and how important they are to the marine ecosystem. Like canaries in a coal mine, they are key indicators of the health of our seas and oceans. And like so many things in this natural world, we are also learning to care about them by getting to know them.